patch out sentence of Shabbat Kroy. Um, it's particularly hard to start because Eamon's just been finishing his speech and there's so many liquors on there and I go for a lot. But I'm not going to take up too much time, just 10 minutes. And although the kind of context, the framework of this meeting is looking at 50 years ago, I was in a round, so I'm hoping that Eamon will cover that. He's opening well too, if you remember. Um, saying, I don't really know about it. <laughs> What I'm actually going to be speaking about, the first half is going to be quite sad and challenging, but I'm really hoping to bring it up with the second half to talk about the opportunities that we have to create something really special. So bear with me through the hard parts, and then once we get to the end, it's going to be something amazing. What I'm really looking forward to is um, the discussion. There's so many people here, like, please get involved in the discussion, and you know, it's not up to us, it's up to all of us here what their life can look like. Um, so I want to start off with the Good Friday Agreement. I was uh, 12 whenever the Good Friday Agreement was signed, and it was generally considered that like people my age were children of the peace process. Um, and it was an era to find an event, and yet I've never known a year without an incident of sectarianism or police violence, and all the while they try and sell us this life of uh, believing in the process. And when it did bring an end to some of the worst parts of political violence, it made other aspects of society much worse. I grew up with people suffering anger, trauma, loss, poverty, mistrust of the state and police, and victimization, continued victimization of political prisoners. And something about Northern Ireland that's particularly stark is the suicide rates. Um, really high, it's gone up 18.5%. And what that materially means is since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, there have been more deaths in Northern Ireland as a result of suicide than there ever was during the troubles themselves. So clearly there's a, a lot that has to be done and the working classes never did see the dividends of uh, the peace dividends. Um, and why that is, so let's speak on from the region, uh, sectarianism was entrenched in the Good Friday Agreement. And really the establishment would rather have everyone believe that we were fighting over religion and not the conditions that the British state kind of put in place. And in any event, the Good Friday Agreement didn't have a huge amount of power um, and it would also return it. Pat said some of the most reactionary voices, um, holding back any kind of potential for democracy. And this is structurally determined by the nature that both sides, in inverted commas, I didn't say I have a mic when I was practicing, of course I would have, both sides, uh, but it would give guarantees of representation. But what's really interesting about the region is that even so called moderate voices are just not moderate. So during the repeal referendum last year, uh, which was amazing, so great, so great, so great, so so many people I met during the referendum here today, hello. Um, one of the civil rights party MLAs, and they call themselves the so-called party of civil rights, but one of the MLAs at the SLD actually tweeted, and I quote, that the pro-choice movement were just as bad as the pro-life movement, and that to me, is a, as a modern opinion, is just astonishing, but that's kind of the conditions the group party agreements have given rise to. But what I would say is, people of my age, it's very hard to find people who actually do critique the Good Friday Agreement. I think it's so ingrained in us that it ended the troubles and therefore it's something that we need to hold on to. But I think about the austerity that's being passed through the back door of so called demolition, and that is a despicably violent agenda. It's not political violence in the same way we understood it during the troubles. But it's a violence that we need to stand against, and that's the point where I'd like to think about kind of Ireland's future beyond the framework of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, something I also just want to cover very quickly is Stormont wasn't sitting during the repeal of the AIDS referendum, uh, which saw activists come together, and I asked him for permission if I could quote him. He said yes. It was not a demonstration for a United Ireland, but of the United Ireland. It was a United Ireland practice. And that really informed everything that we did and everything that we were about. We had people from all around and come together. But what the success of repeal did is that it challenged strong social conservatism. Like, not only could we see our comrades in the south like, win their demands, but we were left without any kind of government in order to reach ours. And it's at that point that actually, in an odd way, that they're not sitting give activists an opportunity to raise their platform and take it to Westminster. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why that's good and bad, and hopefully it's not too controversial, I hope it makes sense. But last month, as I'm sure many of you have seen in the news, Westminster put its repeal sections 58 and 59 from the 1861 uh, offences against the Person Act, which currently criminalises abortion in the North. 
really like their t-shirts. They're not for sale here, but I'm sure you can get them online. Um, it will no longer be a crime after October 21st, but this still will be access. We still have a long way to go. Um, but this is obviously a very positive step in the short term for the kind of lives of women and pregnant people in the North. And the fact that it happened because of activists is something that we really need to hold on to. And I think that that's something that is particularly important. But in the long term, can we depend on this kind of strategy? I'm not so sure. So something that I hope the discussion brings through today is who is ruling Ireland? Like who is ruling this part of Ireland? Because dictating solutions from Westminster, I believe, falls fall short of any kind of basic uh, democratic kind of provisions. Like I just don't think these democratic standards are good enough. There's no Irish voice in Westminster, and yet we're dependent on them to deliver kind of very basic human rights. But what it also shows us is that despite the promises of the Good Friday Agreement, Westminster is still the de facto ruler. And I think that the crisis in the North is a direct product of the relationship where all the concerns of the politics there are being forcibly subordinated to the task of maintaining also as a British purpose. And this is where I think things get a bit um, scary. I do think that the region is very good in Westminster, and I think that when Boris is Brexit happens, he'll want to rule the region with an iron hand and maintain that British border. And the fact that his government is popped up with the DUP is, is even more alarming. And I, I think if we think, and I don't want to start with Robert Running, and I hope that that's clear, but I've got a lot to fit in in such a short time, so I'm kind of staying well through these. But why would the DUP govern in the North when they can govern the North from Westminster with their hard right pals? And why would Sinn Fein sit in Stormont whenever? if and when British border guards come into play and make the border hard again. I'd also like to say that uh, the border debate has been thrown off by Brexit, and this is just a, a symptom of the more fundamental contradiction that there is a British presence in Ireland, and we continue to face the factor rule. Um, so yeah, before I get to the really happy part where everything's going to be great, it's coming, I just want to cover a few points about the border, because I do think it's worth reiterating. And the first is that it is a British border, not an Irish border. And I do think it's very important that our vernacular represents that. Ireland voted overwhelmingly for independence in the only democratic election ever held for a national parliament. And the six counties in the north were retained, both because of threats uh, from the UBF to cause another war in the immediate aftermath of the First World War, but also the economic benefits, I guess, that the also unionists at the time bought the capital. Um, and the other thing is, is that it's not actually Brexit, it's UK exit, it's just not as, uh, it's not the same Brexit. But I think it's important that despite what I meant, if you were, were 55 percent to remain, the North is even with the rest of the UK. And the border area, so that was uh, fiercely pro-EU, not very critical of the European Union, I'm just raising this to show the inevitable contradictions, that you can't have government by consent, and British rule simultaneously, it doesn't make sense. It's one or the other. Um, and obviously for a lot of people who aren't Irish, who live in Ireland, for migrants and refugees, the border's already existed for them, it's already been a hard border for them, and it's always been partitioned, and I think it's better to describe what's happening now as a harder border, or the potential of a harder border through trade, but people are just as important, and we need to remember that this is a hard border that existed, and um, for those who's vulnerable in our society, um, and finally, just in the border, I think if Ireland, North and South are going to have two jurisdictions, who will enforce the laws? Does any institution actually enjoy enough confidence to push that through? I'm not convinced that that is the case. Um, so here's the bit where we all just feel happy about the future of Ireland. I hope, no, I do hope that that makes sense. I think because I can talk about 69 exactly, I can talk about the legacy that left, the legacy of the Good Friday Agreement what has happened without any form of governance in the North and whatever you know, facets or, or tense of governments just isn't existing. It does seem like we're stuck between a rock and a hard place, like neither the British or Irish governments or international institutions actually have delivered long term wage growth, investment, development, integrated schoolings, or the vital reconstruction that like is really necessary to segregate society. So we are beset by struggles and our Country, I think, and maybe I'm wrong in this, but I do see that the North is a pawn between the EU and Britain, and you know it's just constantly failing. In the hundred years since partition, that's coming up in two years. We've gone from boosting 90% of Ireland's economy to a meager 
extent. And actually, the attack on ship workers at Harland and Wilkes, and these are typically Protestants and pro-unionist workers, I think shows the contempt of the British government on even the most loyal sections of the working class. So I think increasingly we are coming to a point where the opportunity to build alliances and build our movement beyond sectarian politics has never been more relevant. And I do see struggles in the streets uh, against water shortages, for reproductive justice, for LGBT rights, and these successes actually they really give us the opportunity to build something really exciting. And struggles do continue, and we do continue to fight them. Last year there was the Paddy Jackson uh, trials that saw a mass United Ireland movement to resist that. Um, we continue to fight for those austerity attacks on the NHS and education. And where these movements make progress, they establish the exact type of conditions that we can build a new system out of. And that will be worlds away from partition in 1921, and what I see is a stopgap that was created in the 90s. But I do think it's really important that we remind ourselves that a united Ireland won't be united by religions or new state institutions. It can only be united by a mass movement that brings together all of these struggles and goes beyond the kind of typical green and orange politics and goes to the roots of the working class problems that we're facing under austerity. And it's certainly not a Dublin government, and it's not a Green Tory Ireland, it's not a Catholic Ireland, it's not a North South ministerial body, it's not a joint cabinet meeting or a fair trade agreement. I definitely think it's not a blank check as it is more for corporations, and we're not designing the United Ireland to be imposed on anyone. I think that through the movements that are more up in Ireland, we can recapture that spirit of 69 through these referendums, through these campaigns with decent affordable buildings. Strikes for better working conditions. This is exactly the type of Ireland that we can demand. And it was in the land movement, the revolts of the working classes, the Dublin lockout, that we first saw visions of an Ireland free from the British. And Greta reminded me earlier about the Soviets in Cork, and their slogan was butter non profit. We've already done it, so we can do it again. Um, but I just want to end by saying that for me, and certainly what I would like to see happen more, both in the diaspora and from people back in Ireland, that we can develop these politics and we are seeing a vision of an Ireland that is far more democratic, far more emancipatory than any piece of agreements or constitutional arrangements and it can be. Uh, I'm not the expert in pop hole, but I'm not general to Michael Jackson. Now, I don't really know anything about the history of the Irish but I'm general to Michael Jackson, a very famous person, now that I know where I come from. from. And Jackson is very sort of as an objective, experienced, military analyst and commentator. Uh, and nobody mentioned that he's also a liar and a mass murderer. And nobody meant that wasn't mentioned in the program at all. And I can say that in passing because that is a distortion. That the fact that it's left out, you can distort things by omission as well as by saying things that are factually wrong. That was a distortion, a grotesque distortion when they present that a Jackson like that. And the reason why they present it like that is very uh, interesting. Jackson was, as you probably know, second in command of the paratroopers of Belfast, uh, uh, sorry, and Derry uh, on Palm Sunday. He was also, as you may not know, the man who personally, in his own handwriting, wrote out the Bloody Sunday cover up. He got soldiers to come sort of and talk to them, or, uh, as he sat on the back of an armored vehicle, a wee street called uh, a Clarence Avenue, and Derry, and wrote down, he said, he said, wrote down, for every soldier here over the fire, he wrote down where the soldier was standing, where the target was, through the line between them, between the two ordnance serving uh, a map, and it was just this document, which then became the official British Army of uh, the Blue Sunday. It was actually in the, just the first time at the early hours of the next morning. A uh, release there one called Harry Galtel Payne, the news of the BBC what were reserved. This has the account of what had happened. I don't know where it's curious things about uh, uh, about, uh, about all that. It's, uh, it just gave a sort of sweet email May uh, 2003, and it was called back to the report. Uh, it, it, it was in 2003, and it was called back to give the second day. The first day, it made no mention of this bizarre or the event. There was he sat and spoke to 21 soldiers, one after the other. Did you fire? Did you fire that? Where was the target? What did happen? Group diaries. Target was fired in Europe. Or uh, a, 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 a blast bomb or something. A revolver or a rifle or something. All very detailed. 
Uh, right and so on. Jackson, first name again, I can't get it around with it. You never refer to it. And you don't think we read that now, though. You know, so, uh, 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 the pilot is just murdered a whole lot of people, there's chaos around the time, and you're sitting there doing a job, it must have taken an hour to do it. It would have taken an hour to do it. And he didn't mention it, it didn't come up at all. I mean, came back a second time, and I won't go into the detail of why he, uh, uh, he, he was called back uh, a second time. He explained. Now, the first doing evidence, he had entirely forgotten the whole incident. He didn't know, I couldn't explain why, but he had entirely forgotten the whole incident. Then, when we had subsequent evidence of people who got up on their oath and said, yes, but it was Jackson who did that, his old sort of junior officer, but it was a major officer, no, I didn't do that. That was General Jackson, that's his uh, handwriting. Jackson then explained to October that that evidence, when he read it, in fact, quote, stirred a big memory. Stupid way, but I think something. The doctor said, What will happen? What's happening? That is my handwriting. I'm also talking. Now, what we're going to get into is this. Oh, I started the day, and you might be aware of it. There's a huge controversy going on. Now, let's say, it's a very real controversy with Gary. You know, sorry, a black man called Soldier F, a member of the parachute. Uh, nice man. The parachute member. He's got a cipher. I thought, exactly, Gary, he's very good. He's got a red cipher in the magazine. And I was just reading this. And then we pulled her ass and all. The guy who was responsible for such a damn bloody disaster in Gary had then somehow risen to the very top. But of course, the explanation is simple. And this is despite his when he did a bloody something that he rose to the top. It was because of 
Michael Jackson had got the army and the British state for a great service in punching through the copper of of uh, Bloody Sunday. And we get him out around the world and entirely, entirely false. Now when a guy got that way, 20, 26 years old, the captain, you will be spotted immediately by your superiors as a lad to watch, and a lad to uh, promote leaders and qualities uh, and, all, and all the rest of it. So there he is, and this epitomizes the way the British state and the vast majority of the British media actually present Northern Ireland. And the last order that appears of all these years later as an objective and authoritative uh, analyst commentator uh, uh, on military matters. You extend that right across uh, uh, the whole you know, politics and the whole of the of the army. The way in which the people at the top, the top brass of the army, of the police, or the, you know, the security services, as they call them, the way they are in, in fact, exonerated. When the state is forced, Northern Ireland proves this. When it is forced by political considerations, by political pressure of other countries, or from below, from campaigns, and so on, when it is forced to admit that it has done wrong, once it does it, it pins responsibility for it on the people at the bottom, a company called the Poor Money Infantry. They get the blame for it. And that is why I said, and I've said it in Ireland to some people, I've said it to some, some people, that I have a tiny sliver of sympathy for the soldier. Yeah, I look around and see the men who sent them in to do that, who ordered them to do that, are still sitting in high places comfortably and even commenting on it on television. Now, this is a this is our and so on. But that is a, sort of a model of how things have worked since the entry of the British Army, so they walk to the streets eh, eh, of the army. That sort of a pattern sort of, eh, 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 can be applied to a whole series of that. Uh, they, they, they took on the upside, I can remember from, from uh, just before Bloody Sunday, from you were saying about 50 years ago, if I wanted to have, I have a lot of happy memories of it, but people don't admit, you know, about the civil rights movement in the early days, they don't just breathe fall. You know, it's hard to admit it, you're trivialist, but you don't be saying that. It was a laugh of life until it was a sort of he took it serious. But one of the things that made it fall, one of the things that made it exonerated was this. But all this was part of the whole post about 1968 or rising and student rebellion of 1968. You can read whole books about it. There's no mention of Northern Ireland at all. As if you have Carter's and Rome, and the Black Panther uh, movement, and the anti war movement, and the civil rights movement, and all that there. So as if all that was separate from what happened in Ireland. And that could have gone way, way, way back in history. That has been a model of the people that have been discovered. They're always sort of like, we're sort of a, a laughing and dancing sort of people, sort of having it serious. But there's always a glint in our eye, isn't there? Sort of the way sort of the way he defends the fact that. So it's not seen, Northern Ireland and the struggle in Ireland is not seen as starting as, as part of a huge international movement. But that was crucial to the morale and the direction of things in the very early days. And if you're hurtling down Roswell Street towards the edge of the box, with a stone in your hand, chanting, Two, four, six, eight, organize and smash the state. There was something liberating about being able to think that, that other people far away around the world were chanting exactly the same slogan as we saw, so I still was here, at exactly the same force. And that was sort of not perfect. They, they, they were not part of history. They presented something discreet happening on the streets of Belfast and Gary, actually, actually. It was a, 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 a result that sort of was extremely a great problem. A lot of people don't want to know that, including Irish nationalists. And often our Irish nationalists are like to present what has happened in the last 50 years as a straightforward continuation, linear continuation, that are up there going to be happening for 800 years. Well, there's that aspect to it, but it's not the only aspect to it. So we throw the international financial and our American century in the panel of the, uh, 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 the working class people of Ireland. Now, at the time, sort of, even the boss had the two programs, sort of, go through the things of 68, 72, and uh, the pain sort of went off you, uh, uh, about some of the troubles. But it's interesting to do, if you look at the things now, and from the way you have to look at some of the things now, the similarities between now and 50, 45, 50 years ago, there's a lot of them. In mean, what an international story now in Northern Ireland. I don't know if they're particularly sure, but uh, 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 the whole of Europe apart, hanging on the pension of an ugly barber. You know, it's a perverse thing. 
you're not going to be much, right? And we saw a lot of people in our life are very happy with that. That's yeah. the issue. Because I'm so pro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I believe that uh, last week, there's nothing to do with the boss. I do it at all because of the boss. <laughs> I had a pocket this in a carnival show. But the international dimension around oh, no. is evident now just that a because of that. You know, for the Nancy Pelosi, a pretty useless person, by the she is the majority, the majority of the majority of the majority of the House of Representatives, right? She is a derby. She is a derby that says if anybody can't get pulled a hard harder in Ireland, they can go to the indeed. Uh, I, I wow! You know, there's our border, and there's this and then there's Macron, and uh, what he called Angela Merkel, and everybody uh, got there. It's an international thing, and it always was the underlying point uh, 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 that I'm making. So when you consider all the things that happened around you, you think Brexit's complicated? Really? You know, it's a, uh, wow, well, I mean, as I'm trying to detach the border of Ireland from the south, uh, and it, 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 or go back to that because that's, it's not going to happen as I explained shortly. In fact, I was doing that. You know what people are talking about? Uh, will there be a hard border or a soft border in Ireland? And you know, actually, you don't know, need those. You know, because if you think of a quotation to uh, uh, in some of the current situation, it wouldn't be from Marx or it goes much less to the economy. It would be from William Goldman. Not many people are people know, not many people are people who know of William Goldman, which is true, because they don't agree to scream. There's a lot of time, he had uh, two Oscars. He wrote uh, the staff board ways, he wrote all the president's men, and wrote a series of uh, it. But he also wrote a very uh, uh, interesting book, which is called you know, uh, Dylan Thomas, uh, years earlier in the book of the same year, Adventures in the Skin Trade. And uh, Goldie began his book, which is about his expenses, he threw a story about his life in Hollywood, sort of an old movie, and that's all that. It began with the sentence. The only thing you need to know about Hollywood is that nobody knows anything. Now, there's Brexit summed up. There's the border question in Ireland summed up. So I'm not going to tell you, nobody knows anything. I know he knows anything about Brexit. It's not right. Nobody can stand up and say, I know my fucking work out. You don't know. You know, it's a. a, a well, the Boris Johnson does not know about that, so he won't be expecting to do or so you would expect to have this in the hell of grass, but they don't because it can't be grass. You know, it's like a, but there's all the simple things involved in it. It was like there's something bright and so on, it's going to be a hard part, or it's going to be a hard part, sort of in Ireland. But I think that it's not going to be anywhere, it's worried about that. And I consider this, that this might make your time as you're going to come to this week, this might make it worth it. Right. There is not going to be a hard border in Ireland. The reason there's not going to be a hard border in Ireland is that people won't stand for it. And when you say people won't stand for it, it's nothing to just go out and complain. Anybody who puts posts along the border. In Germany, where I live, if you go in any one of three directions, west, north, or south, from the house where I live, within four miles, within four miles, you're in the south, you're in the Republic of Ireland. Also, it's a, a, the idea that you're going to put a, a block minor roads or other installations if you check customs and so on. People will tear them down with their bare hands. Yeah. Sorry, over the years, over the last 50 years, they're here in Ireland, even in America. So, uh, 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 I, 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 I spoke to them about the civil rights movement that was after that and so forth. And it just be that simple. Just be that simple. I think we're going to be charged with the SWP, it's going to be no more speaking at the University of Christ or something like that. You know, you're going to go to it, didn't have to be the thing about it. You didn't want to have to do with the grass, the grass, the tax, the blue of the night. That was the important thing, blue of the night, and just a, a, a to drop the night. What is the night now? What is the night now? What is the relevance? Sort of the troops right now. What is the relevance? Sort of just calling for a United Ireland, hoping that that's going to bring the long time and ideas from the IA and all the rest of them. Nobody really knows. As far as I'm concerned, kind of, as a socialist, there are some, and a thing like this, and a thing like this is a mark just to hold on to what we do know. To hold on to what is certain from a working class and a socialist uh, point of view. And may I mention, so, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 so the United Action, North and South, sort of, the media after that, the trial. 
Michael Jackson, the very popular guy, uh, uh, a couple of years back, when you had instantly, instantly, within a day, you did, you had thousands of people down the street from Cork and Dublin and Derry and Belfast, right across the place, nobody heard of these, at least nobody organized it, a race across there, nobody, it just happened, it just happened. You know, like, the, 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 the campaign in the South for the uh, uh, abolition of the constitutional ban on horse, putting on an awful lot of people, overwhelmingly young women, uh, from the North of the campaign. And we want an example of how complex this can be at the same time as being cheered. I'm only watching the pictures, uh, you probably don't know where you are, but on the news, there will be an announcement of the result of a referendum. There will be a court guard at Dublin Castle, where other things happened many years ago. These British military uh, headquarters were there for many, many years. But I think going to be jammed with people, jammed with people. And a lovely day as well. Everybody was happy and smiling and cheering and all the rest of it. And one of the things that happened was that uh, uh, a politician, uh, uh, Michelle O'Neill, the leader of Sinn Féin in the bar, as she walked up to a, 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 a platform uh, uh, to wait for the party, because everybody did, it was for a representative of the other political parties. She took a placard from somebody who was standing there in front of the crowd, you know, and said, The North is next. North is next. The interesting thing is this. The woman from whom she took back hard, the daughter of a prominent DUP politician. I can see her something. I think it's a late honorable, a honorable, a late honorable Sir Jeffrey Donaldson. That's me, yeah. I'm oh, sorry, for all the other past, I'm leaving out of the top of the paper. I'm going to draw that. Young woman. Uh, 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 it's a sort of core adventure. Uh, 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 you know, the, uh, uh, you know, does that tell you something? Or it changes the time? Does that? I see he's down there in Dublin, which used to be sort of a, 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 a inner circle of hell as far as the Northern Unionists were concerned. And if you show him over that background, check the dark is next. You know, she wasn't making a political point. That's the point. The point is she wasn't making a point. This is natural. This is spontaneous. Now this is just an expression of the, uh, 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 of the general, uh, well, the not be talking about the DUP, but the DUP is over here, whether they call it or whatever they call it, confidence and supply, I mean, uh, so there must be Tory government. There actually was consternation in the British press, and I didn't discover who the DUP were, and they realised that the majority of these representatives in Westminster actually believed that the earth was only for 600 years old. There's a president of the state, a party representative of the parliament, who freezes water cash. You know, and then, of course, we don't go into the marriages to women, the marriages to gay rights and all the rest of it. They're the What weird people they are. They are weird people. You might wonder at this point, well, how come that from a party of that sort, that uh, 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 an emerge of the daughter of one of their leaders, Emerged in the way she did, but in the courtyard of Dublin Castle. Well, you see, the truth is this, and it's a really complicated sort of picture of Northern Ireland, but it's necessary then. The supporters of the DUP, the voters of the DUP, do not include anything more than about 5% of the people of them who believe that the earth is only 6,000 years old. They believe any of that. The other any public opinion survey of the Northern Ireland Life and Time survey, which is not a fly by night, which is not a fly by night, uh, uh, a, a public opinion poll, but which is actually sort of a formidable piece of research of organized by Queen's University and Ulster University uh, in Germany. Uh, and it does trace the actual views of the changes and uh, views of people in the North, women, men, rich and old, uh, uh, hey, rich and very young and old, and all the rest of it. Catholic and Protestant. It shows you no actually, and they do this to the point where there are anecdotal from our own experience that they do not confirm this. And for example, if you're a supporter of the DUP, you are at least as likely as a supporter of Sinn Féin or the SDLP to back gay markets. At least as likely. If you're a supporter of the uh, uh, DUP, you are at least as likely to support abortion law reform as are members of Sinn Féin or any other party. That's kind of intuitive, because you think that that's such a right-wing party, the DUP. How can their voters be so different with their political profile? Well, of course, the reason is that they're a political people, the DUP. It's not to do with any of these things. 
They said, those are trivialities. Women fights, and uh, 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 gay rights, and so far. What matters is maintaining the union. The union between Northern Ireland and Britain. Wave the flag and everybody must salute. That's what they said. That's in contradiction. Finally, that's in contradiction with what people are thinking, including the mass, particularly of young working class people, and more especially of young working class women. Sort of uh, in the north, the attitude of the DGP is a sharper and sharper contradiction to, uh, uh, a, a, to our, to our uh, uh, assumptions and to the assumptions of the people that they perform a uh, direct Well, the fact is that going to have over the next couple of years, what the fact is it's going to have sort of division, the communal division in the north, between north and south, what's its relevance to Brexit or anything else? I don't know. I don't know how it's going to work out. I have no idea whatsoever. How it's going to work out when I do know. It's really interesting. It's really interesting. And it opens up sort of thoughts, sort of perspective that we never uh, 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 really knew uh, 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 existed. You see, look, uh, uh, if, 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 if you take all the history, sort of, of the last 50 years and add it up, sort of, if you look back to what we thought then, as Pat said, we used to. I was meeting sort of like this sort of low God and went, boy, what are we certain? Right, sir. We were certain of where we were going. We were playing a sort of fixed, or a fixed on the prize, sort of an all of that. But you know, the national struggle, we were working past the position, and I didn't know that there. I used to be able to do that sort of scheme. The front of it, so it's not a good holiday. You know, so that is not anymore, not anymore. And I don't know what the future is going to bring. What I do know is that there are more possibilities in the present situation than there ever were sort of in the last uh, 50 years. So why I can stand here and say that I'm more confused about the future. And if you're not confused about the future, you're not the mother, then you're not paying attention. You know, that's really happening. And particularly in our, but it's also true, uh, uh, over a year. We might have struggled with death for a So, what's that? Oh, what's that? Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. Y'all are going to love it. Yeah, right. Y'all are going to love it. Y'all are going to love it. You have to look for signs of hope. There are limits of all the darkness. You have to look sort of for a spark that's going to blow on and turn into a flame. You have to look for that all the time, sir. It's not so easy to spare. But I, I, I give up. And apart from, you know, the advanced sort of uh, women in Ireland, north and south, and the way sort of it's natural, sort of what I think it becomes an all Ireland, a, 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 a Ireland movement. We've also seen, and you've seen it here, everybody sees it. But the whole rise of sort of young people and the environmental issues. They've got a school, schools like Plan for We have a plan for me. Uh, uh, students will tell us a plan for the 20th of September. It was going to be a. Welcome back to that abortion thing in a minute. Don't know what you're to say about it. But the. Uh, uh, a, a, you saw me say, I mean, I, I was guilty of that anyway. I mean, it's like when I look at me, all the new people here are no ones to be. You know, sort of, it's at least that stage, you know, 76, so I have to back, sort of, see people, sort of, and they all seem to be. But there are actual children on the streets now, right? Children, illegally children, under their knees, loads of them. They've got it, they've got it, they've got the point about climate change. It's not that they, 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 there's a number of schools, right? Most of them, a few months back, I forget exactly what it was. But we had most of all that success with Derry, I will say, sort of, there are about, I don't know, about a hundred young people sort of running about to the city centre. Not quite sure what it seemed to be how it was going to be called You know, sort of not quite sure sort of what they were going to do or what they were expected to do. Until somebody appeared in one of our conferences, in fact, with a wee megaphone. You know, we hand out a megaphone and give it to them, hand it to a young woman who was standing there. She couldn't use it, I think, because she was looking at the movie, figuring it out. She was trying to work out a bit, whistling. We look at all that the way it looks at you. She found that that didn't work. And when did she tell it worked? She was off. She was off. She was 16 years old. And she was marching around the guild hall. You know, the shirt was sitting there. Blah, blah, blah. Smash, tell them. Blah, blah, blah. All, all this stuff. No volunteer at all. And she was passing on to somebody else. And you could see, you could see in front of your eyes. You saw a new generation of radicals and potential revolutionaries being created in front of your eyes. No, there it was. I thought the future's okay. And I think it, it may have been asked this party to, and then still uh, uh, a dark area or something. It gives them entirely new meaning. The old phrase, woman and children first. And I said, that was a new going. I, 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 I,
years. I remember somebody asking Cliff, well, who's going to actually beat the revolution? And Cliff said, 27 year old lesbians. <laughs> and he was right, and they were pretty good. This is about 30 years ago. Not many people were looking for leadership for uh, uh, 27 year old lesbians 30 years ago. We got that that one that uh, 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 already. Uh, 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 I was going to say something else about so the abortion issue. Uh, uh, there was another uh, zinger. What's that? <laughs> No, 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 I forgot, I don't know, people ask the question about that one time. So, the, 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 I think I want me to look back, but I sort of say, I've the stage for, uh, I will be attempting to act, but I don't act. Sort of like some sort of, uh, a, a elderly philosopher, you know, sort of looking wise, you know, around me, and, uh, looking back. But, but I'm not that at all, I've still got huge hopes for the future. You know, I place all my hopes in the woman and the young people of Ireland. All my hopes. I have a place in there. Not sort of traditional sort of organizations that made their roles of pain and all the rest of it. There's a different spirit around. And despite all our candles troubles, the division of Brexit and uh, hard borders and, and all the rest of it, what gleams through that thing of a young Protestant woman going from Devil Last with that packet to Dublin, in the midst of it all, of darkness and despair, there you have a torch raised. Without anybody on the front, including yourself, probably, having thought sort of about the, uh, uh, about the uh, uh, political uh, implications. And we spent words the same words surrounded by the border uh, uh, in Derry. So we spent a lot of time during the uh, abortion referendum uh, campaign a couple of months back. So I remember it was the last year. It was last night. Last night. No more than a year. Yeah. Good <laughs> It's a big uh, uh, fight. <laughs> so we better hurry up. Uh, 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 it, you know, we had sort of loads of people going around. That's the youngest champion I've ever been involved in. Even I know people look younger than me, but it's not me getting old in the midst of a young girl. The average age of the people walking on the board is probably about 20. I would say that 70% of them are women. Now, this is a very unusual campaign. But you look back anywhere, here or out of ground, where else can you remember that composition? of our campaign. And there it is, I don't think nobody had a perspective of this. It happens when people come forward. They will build the future. In there. They will build the future and they are not you know, coercioned by it and they are not constrained and constricted by sort of old categories. They are there, sort of the very powerful sort of Columbia Theater sort of HLA, but they are not the people you are making get up. They are not the people you are actually making a, a history of the world. And maybe that's why I said, shut up. I mean, sorry, but that's kind of a, 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 what I wanted to end with, uh, uh, a, 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 was this, sort of that, in a funny way, I think we were very rigid, sort of 50 years ago. Uh, a, we had sort of our, uh, our formula, sort of which we were talking about. And I still believe sort of enough, of course I do, of course I do. And I do believe that, oh, one other thing sort of about, about class and the norm. This is example, we don't expect anything to uh, happen. We don't know yet how it's going to work out. May have mentioned sort of that the hard to go by shipping hard is about to be told that a call to receive or something, a ministry, or whatever they are, a call to the receive. There's only about 150 shipping hard for me. That's the bill fast. You should be 20,000. 20,000. It's down to uh, uh, 150. And there's loads of things that strange history of shipping hard and the hard to count like hardly ever we're going to be working on something. Any numbers um, uh, at all. But the right company, I'm sort of demanded, right, sort of nationalize the shipyard. No massive sort of about getting a grant or anything like that. Nationalize the workers who are uh, left. And that in itself sort of attracts a, a other people to it. But there's a campaign in the North as well for an Irish language act to throw the big sticky points between Shipyard and the DUP. Yeah, and actually, it's got to the Royal Mail to give formal recognition to the Irish language and a few other advantages. A, 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 a go with that. So, where are the shipyard workers? But not the storm, they know there's no government in storm, but they're not going to have them as a symbol. They're going to they to protest about the closure of the day of the yard. They find themselves standing alongside campaigners for the next language. Within an hour, there were shipyard workers shouting in Irish for an Irish language. All standing together. Now, again, the point they're making is that nobody organized that. Nobody had a, a, you know, think of that, the events are into a theoretical framework which resulted in shipyard workers speaking in Irish and demanding an Irish language. It emerged from struggle 
and a marriage from the reality as all good things in marriage. That the body that is the most hopeful thing in Ireland that in recent years has been not just with women and young people in the rest of it, but the simple fact that thousands of people on the streets have driven politics forward, even in the midst that of all the darkness and confusion of Brexit and what's happening along the English border and the rest of it. And that is an end uh, a, a, with this. I like the end of a hopeful moment. As you will know, I, I, I think you probably don't know, a lot of these some people will not know. Did you know that on October the 22nd, next, Northern Ireland will become one of the most liberal progressive places in Europe with regard to a woman's right to choose a woman's free production race? Isn't that amazing? Northern Ireland. This is the backward hole that, you know, sort of represented by the TUP and the Norwegian government, the Tories and all that there. Northern Ireland has got to leap to the front for sort of all the, uh, uh, a, what would be the doctor red sticks, sort of, uh, a, red across Europe. That's going to happen because the citizens are going to be different way, obviously that's the same way, actually, with Evo Marriage, with that gay marriage on the 22nd of the world. That's going to be one ball to our uh, uh, as well. The reason for this is that the historic government could never pass, never did pass, any of these uh, uh, a, a, a law of progressive laws like that. They're not being passed by Westminster. It only sometimes say the right way or the pressure is going to be low for the change in politics and all the way back. I'll be putting some more than that, I promise the, 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 after the demonstration for women trying to choose, we're all going to forget it. Abbott, uh, in Dublin, they were like, I don't know, every last year, they were forget it. They had a huge demonstration, 20, 25,000 people marching through uh, Dublin, a number of political parties represented, the trade unions, uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, some other parties weren't represented at all, the official capacity of these were very it. But it was not back, the idea of just saying no to the constitutional prohibition uh, on abortion because we're never going to get our members until the idea to get it through. At the demonstration, which is a very square sort of uh, in Dublin, very little policy for the death, sort of made the final speech of which she talked for a couple of minutes about Sinn Fein and abortion. And she referred to the leader of Sinn Fein, Mary Lou McDonald, and she said, Listen, Mary Lou, you get on site. With us, are we going to beg you? Yes, the roar of the freedom of that was absolutely amazing. And you can see the individual members of the Champions. Some of my friends, they were actually down there with them, looking at, oh my God, within a week, within a week, the position of the party had changed. Not because of internal arguments, but because of that pressure. There's 20,000 people roaring the blue and all that. All young, radical, nearly one boy, we better get on site. That's right. We better, we better, we better be that's all right. Let's try to get them uh, uh, behind us. So uh, those are the things that are happening. I haven't meant to say that. So I'm very lost. I don't think I can say that. You know, so the only thing I say with this kind of is that uh, it might have been naive. It even was naive. But I think sort of what we were doing in like, 68, 69, 70 and so forth. But I look back on it. Sort of like cringe sometimes. So that broke the patterns of war and every side. There is a new edition of it, I think it's on Sale and Magazine. But uh, we just had uh, last year this new edition uh, uh, on each year, Sale and Magazine, War and Every Side. So the key market press said, well, you're right, uh, a new introduction, no problem, we're going to do introduction. That's a very thing you want to change, sort of in the text. Yeah, it was a bit dodgy, you know, sort of because they were trying to get past it and read the original. Can I make you look smart and prescient? Sort of uh, uh, so I got reading it and see, sort of, like, acted out the abandoned because on every page there was something that would have to change. Sort of, I thought, wait, did I say that? Jeez, said it. Maybe I should have said that. It was a really terrible experience reading it again. I have to drink it, I'll stay off and say, take it as it is. So I put it out. While we were naive, we were confused. We were sort of spaced out, sort of high hopes of the spirit of the age. I'm not moral on that and all the rest of it. Why is not so far on it every day? Well, <laughs> people say, I warn you, you know, he's holding this stuff, you know, day after day, and what, oh, God Almighty, you become a thing. What? Oh, hey, that's a nice moral on it as well. But all that stuff is around the day, and how happy we felt as I mentioned, sort of how far we're looking. I think that in the midst of the darkness, it is possible to see light like that again. 
We see it of people on the street. We see it in the scriptyard workers in the Irish language. A can't live. We see it over and over again. And the thing is, the trick is, if you can preserve that, if you can give political expression, then you've got a real chance of creating a new future in Ireland, North and South, aid for everybody. But that's always been the requirement. And let's be blunt about it. If you don't want any kind of thing, you think, you know, how about it? What we have to learn from our neighbors? And the first thing that we have to learn is that the people are charging forward in thousands, in thousands. It shouldn't be our role to try to educate them and say, that, by the way, sir, you have to understand this from a Marxist point of view. So if we start giving them lectures, if we know that won't work because we've tried before, but over and over and over and over again. But in North it is just a short law in terms of the waves of, 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 of radicalism. But what you can do, what you must do, is to understand that what is happening is sort of a grassroots level, down below, and as I say, what is particularly happening, sort of with the thing that has happened, with the thinking of women and young people in North, that that, that, that is the billow of gold dust. That's coming out of what we have to be able to collect and uh, 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 use. If we don't, history will forgive us. Now I'm talking brand new, brand new compared, I know, but I think it's a simple fact that in the midst of it all, when we say there's all sorts of possibilities, nobody knows what's going to happen. That means that nobody knows what's not going to happen. Nobody can rule anything out. And we must be in a position where we are talking about socialists in Ireland and in Britain, there are those who are in favour, there are liberation from imperialism and, 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 and capitalism. And we say that anything might happen, we have to make sure that the things that might happen include, include, turn to what the movement has done through the years and down through the centuries has uh, uh, wanted to happen. We have real possibilities again. If we waste them again, or you might not call that the young, because I won't put it out for you later, so if you like, in the possibility, in the, in the sense of the outright fascism emerging in the world, is no longer a scare story. I mean, there's a realistic possibility. Rosa Luxemburg said all those years ago, racist history, of course, but sometimes a deep fundamental truth are some history. We will have socialism, or we will have barbarism. And we see the barbarism rising all around us. What we need to do, Develop a socialist feeling and a socialist movement big enough, strong enough, self confident enough, clear enough in the ideas to take off the forces of the partners and make up the world with socialism. Thank you.